Hello everyone and welcome back. This video is inspired by recent reflections by Javier Rivera, my friend Javier, who has his own YouTube channel that I would recommend you go and check out. His recent reflections are about the task of philosophy, what philosophy is and the philosophical approach to life, you know, in a big conversations that includes lots of different voices. How does a philosopher enter into the conversation? What is that philosophical style of entering into dialogue, entering into a conversation? What is the promise? If you assume that at the heart of any conversation, there's a promise, there's a promise that something is going to be delivered. What is the distinct type of promise that is in a philosophical conversation? What does philosophy promise? In one of the videos, Javier talks about taking a stance that if you want to engage in philosophy, if you want to get into a philosophical mode of talking, thinking, conversing, you have to practice taking stances. Take a stance because committing to a position, committing to a stance is part of the philosophical method. It is by taking that stance, you allow yourself to really examine what that position is, what, the, what it entails, what you are really accepting, what are the implications of the stance that you took. If you don't really take the stance, you will not discover all, the, all that is involved, the complexities of that stance. And that reminded me a lot of you know, my, philosophical, my, my own philosophy classes when I was a student. And I remember not just in uh, philosophy courses, but in many courses outside of philosophy, there was always this instruction to write an argument that the goal of the course is to teach us how to argue, how to take up a position and then defend it, make a case for it. I'm more or less comfortable. Of course, this is, it's a way, very good and useful way of starting the uh, education in philosophy. But is that what philosophy is only about? Is that all that philosophy is about? Are there other ways of engaging as a philosopher, as a philosophical thinker? I mean, you don't have to call yourself, you don't have to call ourselves philosophers, but are there other ways of engaging with philosophy or engaging philosophically that is not argumentative and combative? You commit here and then you go for it. You fight the other side. <laughs> because your stance is always in opposition and in contradistinction with the other side. That's usually, that's a typ typically, that's the, that's the case. Now, what I want to consider is, is it possible to think about a philosopher in a way that is more similar to an artist? And if so, what would that mean? What would an artist philosopher do? Artists... In their, even in their most intense way of engaging with their work, they are not combative. They don't need an other side to argue against. Instead, they are engaged with something that, first of all, something that is a part of their experience that they need to recognize, they need to somehow express that they are witnessing something. Then that witnessing, it has to do with, in part, what is out there in their environment, in their ecology, in, their, in the world where they are existing. And it has also something to do with who they are. So in other words, it has something to do with their being in the world. And an artist insists on something that they, they are identifying, something that they are noticing, something that they're observing, they're perceiving, and they want to be faithful to that so they start practicing, getting into actually expressing that, the thing that stands out, the thing that is important to them, the thing that is significant to them, meaningful to them. They start the practice of you know, overtly insisting on the, on the presence that is, that is significant to them. The part of their way of being in the world that they want to, to show. Not necessarily to an audience, but to show, to flesh out, to express, to bring out, to bring it out. Congruent with that overall image, you can imagine a philosopher who is sitting at a desk and just examining language, putting words together in order to express a thought, in order to continue a movement. 
or in order to sustain the continuity of a movement of thought, sustain the continuity of thought. They're sitting there. They're not really fighting against something. If they're fighting against something, maybe it is fighting against stagnation. But that's not really an enemy when you're talking about arguing or combating against another side. You are usually talking about somebody like you, a peer, that is more or less the same, but they disagree with you on this one thing. There's one issue that you disagree about and you get together and, or you write papers. Uh, for a combative philosopher, for an argumentative philosopher, that exercise of going back and forth, arguing with each other is maybe intrinsically valuable, but what is more valuable, what is primarily the motivation, is that you both want to solve a problem, but you disagree about maybe some ingredients uh, of the solution, of the right solution. You, I think that the ingredient of a solution, for example, involves believing in pantheism or panpsychism, that everything is, there's a psyche in everything in the world, and your solution might involve not believing in that or believing in a mechanistic universe that is largely or almost exclusively mechanistic, and then there are some creatures, some beings that are conscious. That's just one example. It's not really something I like to think about, the plot problems. Uh, the, in general, philosophers who devote their whole career to arguing for panpsychisms, like I, that really puzzles me. But that's not relevant to our conversation. I'm remembering now certain episodes from my life episodes from my very early on in life uh, when I was maybe six, seven, eight, nine years old. And I would participate in things, in activities as mostly as an observer, but I would accompany, for example, my grandfather. I would go when my grandfather was grilling something, barbecuing, preparing food in the, in the backyard, grilling food in the backyard. And he would, you know, engage. He would just, he would do it. He would have his ritual of cleaning the grill, warming it up, making fire. And he was not, you know, you can't describe that as in taking a stance or arguing or combating. He's just doing something. And then I am observing it. And I, through that observation, I join in. I start to appreciate that activity. And I start to sympathize and get the point of it. Can a philosopher do, do it like that? Can a philosopher show a form of life that gains sympathy from observers? Not through discursive persuasion, not through argumentation, not through beating the other side, beating up the other side, but through just simply engaging with something in a way that is visible. In a way that is visible. Now, I'm remembering, for example, passages from Derrida or passages from Heidegger where they are not really arguing, they're exploring. It's like going on a walk with someone. Again, with my grandfather, I used to go hiking, climbing hills, climbing mountains, and just going along, going along with him as a kid and discovering that activity for the first time as both a participant and an observer, realizing what it is that we are doing. And we would walk together in silence. We'd look at plants together, look at birds together, you know, set places to sit and have a snack, have a drink. And those are ways of communication that I identify as art. So what my grandfather was doing, what, was, what he was showing me was aspects of his life as an artistic project, as an active project. These are things you could do with your free time. You could go for a hike. You could go climb this hill. You can go spend time in nature. You can go by the water. You, know, you can go to this hot spring. Again, with my grandfather, we, do, we did those things on occasion. There, there were revelations involved, and those kinds of revelations are what artists continue to invite us to to be a part of, to explore. In my way of seeing things, that has to be included in a philosophical engagement with life. And I see that the reason why I, I'm drawn to Javier's work is because he embodies that. And I think the best parts of Javier's work, your work, Javier, if you're watching this, 
the best part of your work are those moments when you're not changing anybody's mind, when you're not making a case for anything, when you're not arguing, when you're not necessarily being combative, but you're insisting on something that there's a self-sufficient insistence. It is not going against, moving against something, but just engaging in an activity, not because there's an other that you're fighting, you're trying to convince, but just because your way of being in the world entails that activity or invites that activity or recognizes that activity as desirable, as interesting, like a theory about dating. You know, that's interesting. Let's explore that. Let's put these concepts together and see what happens. Oh, interesting. Interesting insight. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. See, that's very similar to a grandfather and a grandson going hiking together. It's like, oh, this is a hill. Let's climb it. This is a park. Let's go for a walk. Let's see what we stumble upon. Maybe nothing. Maybe we won't notice anything interesting and it will still be worthwhile. And it is not about solving a problem. It's just structuring our time, just feeling time, feeling time, being together. Can we do that philosophically? I think we can. I think we can. That way of, okay, we are philosophers, let's solve a problem. That's a very overly practical model. So I think a, a very restrictive metaphor is being applied to philosophy when we do that. When we say, okay, let's, let's get to work. Let's uh, roll up our sleeves and get to work. And the perfect example of the person who did that was John Cyril, who I dislike. I mean, I don't find him interesting as a philosopher. He was like, let's get to work. Let's uh, solve the problem of consciousness. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> My response is like, I don't, I don't care. Like, I'm already, I'm already detecting that something is not right here, as you also agree with this kind of sentiment. All right, I don't know how much of this I need to edit down but I will edit it down and I will uh, end up with something. Hopefully I will send it, post it on, uh, on the channel on Saturday. Thank you, Javier, for being a source of inspiration. I hope other people also found something of interest here and uh, looking forward to speaking with you in the near future. Bye for now.